Good morning and welcome to The Angry Astronaut. On a couple of occasions in the history of this channel, I have talked about the possibility of using Phobos as a base camp in order to better explore and exploit the surface of Mars, whether it be for a one-time visit or multiple visits or colonization. There are many, many advantages to landing on Phobos first and establishing a base there before we attempt to actually land on the Martian surface. Now, of course, this kind of goes with the argument for the Lunar Gateway. A lot of the same justifications that we have for the Gateway also applies to using Phobos, but there are many many other reasons why Phobos is actually a better solution for exploring Mars than the Lunar Gateway is for exploring the Moon. It is a perfect location for a base camp for a wide variety of reasons, and NASA seems to have recognized this because they have decided to commence a simulated mission to Phobos with an all-female crew, interestingly enough, with through their HERA project that they use to simulate deep space missions. Very interesting project, and coupled with this is a proposal from some students at the University of Houston for a future base on Phobos. And in my opinion, this is something that Elon Musk should be paying very close attention to because establishing a base on Phobos could much more easily facilitate his ambitions of colonizing the Red Planet. Why is this the case? Well, I'm going to explain all of this to you in just a moment. And by the way, this is not the first time that NASA has made use of the Human Exploration Research Analog, or HERA, for a Phobos mission. There have actually been several simulated missions to Phobos, indicating that NASA is pretty damn serious about this. The most recent Phobos mission, quote unquote, began on January 27th, 2023, only four days ago, and four women were tasked with the not so enviable job of spending 45 days in close quarters with one another, not coming out of course because they wouldn't do this on a real Phobos mission to simulate the results. There was an all-male crew, by the way, last year, so this will be an interesting experiment to see how an all-female crew performs. Some people argue that single-gender crews are the best way to go, less drama that way, but really there's lots of arguments to the contrary. But gender issues aside, they definitely have some very qualified ladies on this mission. The first is Vanessa Gomez Gonzalez from Madrid, Spain, who's an experienced software engineer who's worked for NASA for almost eight years. Obviously our technical specialist. You also have Sandra Herman, who's a marine laboratory specialist. Now that seems to be a poor fit for Phobos that probably doesn't have any life, at least not life as we know it, but she has a great great deal of experience in utilizing cameras, light microscopes, stereo microscopes, and scanning electron microscopes during her career. And of course, utilizing microscopes is going to be an important part of any scientific journey to Mars, especially if you're retrieving samples from the Martian surface using robots and analyzing this on the base. More about that later. There's also Kimberly Kanish. She's the president and principal advisor of 
Vita or Vita Medical LLC, which is a professional services consultancy for medical device companies. Although not a doctor, her medical background will prove to be invaluable to this team. And then finally, there's Katie Kuby, who works on modeling, synthesizing, and testing simulated lunar soil at a company based in Austin, Texas, that specializes in creating 3D printed habitats. There's a number of reasons why she will be useful to the team. She also worked at SpaceX at one point, by the way, but her primary focus is in engineering. Now, obviously, there are many things about deep space missions that cannot be properly simulated on the Hera project. For example, the extremely small amount of gravity that you have on Phobos cannot be simulated on Earth, but that's not the real objective. The objective is to, for the researchers to learn about crew behaviors while the crew is carrying out various science and maintenance tasks inside Hera, such as analyzing rock samples in a glove box and testing augmented reactions reality capabilities. The researchers will be studying how crew members adjust to isolation, confinement, and remote conditions on Earth before NASA sends astronauts on deep space missions. And during the mission simulation, communication delays will last up to 10 minutes, 5 minutes each way. That at least is realistic. But why would a Phobos base be useful to a manned mission to Mars in the first place? Isn't Mars Direct a better solution in the same way that lots of people believe that a Moon Direct mission is better than using the Lunar Gateway? Well, there's one big reason amongst others, but the primary reason is logistics, logistics, logistics. Scientists suspect, although we're not entirely certain about this, that Phobos bears a great deal of resemblance to most C-class asteroids, which means it has abundant carbon and abundant water ice. Its mass and its composition suggest that it has these sorts of elements in abundance. Once again, we're not sure, and it's important that we send some sort of robotic mission to Phobos in the future to confirm the presence of these elements, but if it is indeed similar to a C-class asteroid, that means it has all the elements necessary to be a fantastic refueling depot, not only for Starship, but for just about any kind of rocket we can think of. So why is this important? Well, the fact remains that no matter how many times you refuel Starship in low Earth orbit, by the time it reaches Mars and prepares for its entry into the Martian atmosphere, Starship is not going to have a tremendous amount of fuel left. This creates fuel slosh issues during the re-entry process, which is going to make Starship more difficult to control, but more importantly, Starship is not going to have as much fuel as would be ideal for a controlled landing. As I have discussed many times in the past, the terminal velocity in the thin Martian atmosphere is incredibly fast, about a thousand kilometers per hour, or nearly four times as bad as terminal velocity is here on Earth. That means you're going to need a lot more fuel to slow Starship down than you would need for a landing on Earth. Landings on Earth are problematic enough as it is. A landing on Mars is going to require a substantial amount of fuel in order for the landing to be stable and controlled. Therefore, refueling on Phobos before you attempt a landing on Mars would be the best way to proceed with Starship. In addition to that, if you want to explore several different locations on the Martian surface with a single Starship journey, you can do that if you have a refueling depot in orbit. Phobos is only 9,000 kilometers away from Mars. It's extremely close and it orbits the planet three times a day. It's so close that it would prove to be an extremely effective location to facilitate multiple visits to the Martian surface as long as you have ample supplies of fuel on the moon. By the way, what you're watching right now is a mere 55 seconds worth of photographs. That's how fast this moon moves through the Martian sky. It's truly amazing and an ideal location for us to operate from. So what other 
advantages does Phobos have to offer besides fuel and logistics? Well, one of the biggest factors that hinders our ability to operate freely and efficiently on the Martian surface is the enormous amount of light travel time between Earth and Mars. The several minutes required in order to send instructions to robots, for example, and receive responses from those robots makes any task a Herculean effort, which means building habitats on the surface of Mars before astronauts arrive, which is part of just about any manned mission plan with NASA or anybody else, requires robots that are going to have to operate entirely on their own or with painstaking instructions that are going to take a very long period of time to complete. But what if you could control these robots in real time? Well, any base on Phobos orbiting Mars three times a day is going to have ample opportunity to do this. You're not going to have to worry about a completely automated robot perhaps miscalculating or malfunctioning during the construction process and not really being able to do much of anything about it or having to spend enormous amounts of time getting the problem corrected. Instead, all of these things can be handled in real time from Mars orbit. And this not only applies to constructing habitats, it also applies to robotic probes or Mars helicopters, Mars dirigibles, whatever you want to use to scout out the Martian surface with robots ahead of any sort of manned mission. It's so much more efficient to be able to control these robots in real time as opposed to either relying on a completely automated process or waiting for 5 to 15 minutes for light to travel the distance between Earth and Mars. This is one of many advantages that Phobos represents, and there is a long-term advantage for Phobos as well, but we'll get into that in a moment once we get into the actual process of constructing the base. So first of all, how would you make use of a base like this, or even build it with the tiny amount of gravity on the surface of Phobos? Doing anything on the surface of that moon would be extremely difficult landing on the surface of that moon would be incredibly challenging. Well, there are a couple of ways of handling this. First of all, rather than landing a spacecraft on Phobos or docking with the base directly, it's better to just tether your spacecraft to the base and then handle your refueling process, transfer personnel along the tether, that sort of thing, rather than trying to land on the surface of the moon. But how do you build the base in the first place? Well, let's get into the details. First of all, like the Lunar Gateway, one of the greatest threats represented to any sort of personnel on the base is going to be solar radiation and galactic cosmic rays. However, Phobos has some built-in protection. If you build the base inside of Stickney Crater, this natural feature will protect the astronauts from an estimated 90% of all solar radiation and galactic cosmic rays, far more protection than astronauts are going to have on the Lunar Gateway gateway, therefore eliminating the need of a lot of radiation protection. Certainly you're going to need some, but not nearly as much as astronauts are going to need on the gateway. The most important component of the proposed Phobos base is called the Truss Landing Assembly, and I'm sorry I couldn't get a complete screenshot of this thing, but it is a very interesting piece of equipment. Here's how it works. It has two different types of thrusters, Nader thrusters for very slow descent rates, and then a Zenith thruster in order to provide the necessary thrust to drive it into the regolith of Phobos. Here's how it works. First of all, the truss landing assembly reaches a predetermined altitude and the nadir thrusters fire in short bursts to slow the descent of the TLA down to centimeters per second velocities. Once contact is made with the regolith, the zenith thruster will begin to fire to produce a force into the regolith. Due to the microgravity conditions on Phobos, the regolith is assumed to be extremely loose and uncompacted. There will be very little reaction force 
force given by the regolith, which enables the grippers on the TLA to make a smooth transition to the bedrock surface. Sensors on the feet will indicate when sufficient contact has been made with the surface, and the micro splines will deploy and retract to grip the porous Phobos surface, while the zenith thruster will continue to fire. Once the micro splines are secured and locked, the zenith thruster will shut down and drilling will commence. The drill bits on the TLA feet are designed to drill into the bedrock and stay there. This provides two anchoring systems, the locked micro splines and the drill bits. After each TLA foot has successfully drilled into the Phobo surface, the TLA module will detach from the TLA and fire its nadir thruster in order to make room for the rest of the base. Once the base's foundation is firmly established, then you can start adding modules one at a time. The first of these modules will be the power module, which will include a modular nuclear reactor, and then a support module. The support module will include a great number of things. The support houses both the medical and life support systems on a single floor. The medical bay includes three wall-mounted beds that can fold up and a ceiling-mounted surgical arm that can perform on injured crew members. Below that is a transfer node floor with six airlocks. Five of these airlocks lead to future expansions of the base. Only one is used at the initiation of the base, and this takes crew members to the spaceport and centrifuge. We'll get to that in just a moment. Before this, below rather, this transfer floor houses the workshop, an area dedicated to 3D printing special parts critical to the upkeep of the whole base. The next module to be installed will be the crew quarters, which by the way is designed as a Bigelow B330 inflatable. Most of these modules are inflatable and have 330 cubic meters worth of space easily deployed by a starship. Now with a total of four floors, the first three would be dedicated to 12 equally spaced crew compartments with the last floor dedicated to storage. Crew members would enter through a sound absorbing mesh doorway that would retract after they pass through it. Inside almost all the furniture, furniture rather will be inflatable or small enough to bring in from other parts of the base such as shelves, desktop, wall storage bins, etc. Using a simple bracelet mounting or velcro strap system, each room could be configured to the personnel's desired layout. The next module to be installed will be the command module, which houses the systems monitoring for the life support systems, power consumption and generation, space flight and EVA support, a Mars Direct Observatory including a virtual reality control for robotic ground support, and a direct astronomical observatory. Below that will be the greenhouse, a galley wardroom for up to 12 people at once, food storage bins, laundry, hygiene, and two restrooms. Now a separate and extremely important part of the base will be the centrifuge and spaceport accessible only through a pressurized airlock shuttle that will travel along the truss system anchoring the base to the ground. The spaceport is composed of a long hallway that has storage capability to quickly unload stowage from resupply vehicles. It also contains a common berthing mechanism and international berthing and docking mechanism to accommodate various current and future spacecraft to the base. and the end of the spaceport contains a hatch that leads to the centrifuge module, which can emulate various gravity gradients. So that, of course, will be very important to increase the effectiveness of exercise and overall crew health on the station, which, of course, is going to be incredibly important given the tiny amount of gravity on Phobos. For all practical purposes, you may as well be in microgravity, at least as far as crew health is concerned. The entire mass of the station with all of the modules combined and including all of the necessary equipment on board is 291 tons, capable of being delivered by three Starship missions. That may sound like a lot at the beginning, but we're talking about a permanent station orbiting Mars with a dozen crew members and a very valuable refueling station that can not only be used to better facilitate a landing on the Martian surface, but also to 
allow for easier departure as well. Any spacecraft that utilizes the necessary Delta V to get to Phobos can then top up its tanks for a return to Earth. Not only that, the orbital speed of Phobos can provide a generous boost of Delta V almost enough to escape Martian gravity without the use of any fuel at all. This would be extremely efficient and helpful to ongoing operations on the surface of Mars. Of course, this all depends on just how much ice and how much carbon is present on Phobos, but according to our best estimates, there are many, many trillions of tons of this stuff if it is similar to a C-class asteroid. This may explain, then, why NASA has simulated so many missions to Phobos through the Hera Project, and there is one more benefit to a Phobos base in the distant future that we haven't discussed, and that is the use of a skyhook. Even though Phobos is not well set up in order to provide a Martian space elevator because it orbits Mars far more swiftly than Mars rotates, it could facilitate what's called a skyhook, in other words, a trailing platform dragged through the upper Martian atmosphere where air resistance isn't much of a problem, where atmospheric vehicles could actually dock with it and then transfer equipment, supplies, or personnel up to the Phobos base without even having to use a rocket. Skyhooks have been an idea proposed for a long time in science fiction, but they could be much more easily facilitated by Phobos in the thin Martian atmosphere. So yes, many, many compelling reasons for NASA to be exploring this option. Once again, as far as the modules are concerned, they are all inflatable, all deliverable by either Starship or other existing rockets, and the mass of the base is really not that problematic. As long as Phobos has the kinds of resources available that we think it does, there are many, many reasons why we should begin our ambitions of colonizing the red planet, not on Mars, but on Phobos. Please keep in mind that I have some merchandise specifically oriented towards a Phobos base. I have that linked in the description. Also, please like, please subscribe, and as always, stay angry about space.